to do, I'd like to in introduce um, the very wonderful and very knowledgeable Miss Kate Brown, who is one of my senior colleagues at Derby, um, and she's going to be doing a very interesting talk on nerve repair. Um, brilliant, thank you. Good, so um, can I get on and share my screen, Carlos? Yes, yes please go ahead. Yeah, that's, that's showing well, yep. Yep, good. Um, right, well, thank you very much, Carlos. It was very kind of you to invite me to give this talk today. As Lundborg, who is one of the great giants of nerve surgery, said that, or has already pointed out to us, that even though we have an amazing amount of new experimental laboratory data, and there's clearly a lot of evolving neuroscientific concepts. Peripheral nerve injuries still remain amongst probably our most challenging uh, reconstructive problems. So my aim tonight with you is to go through what some of our options are. We're going to talk about what they are, the indications, why we do it, what the evidence is to either support or refute that. But it's not going to be a, an all-encompassing talk because that's not going to be possible to keep it within reasonable time limits. And not only that, but I also appreciate that everyone has their own ways of doing things and there are very few absolute rights or wrongs. But before we talk about um, how we're going to manage our nerve gap, I think it's probably important that we go back to reminding ourselves of what exactly happens after we injure a nerve. And some of this is illustrated on this diagram. Immediately after the nerve is injured, a couple of key things happen. The cell body swells up, the nucleus migrates to the periphery, and you can see that there's a disappearance of the basophilic material within the cytoplasm. And this process is otherwise known as chromatolysis. So chromatolysis is a marker of axon regeneration, but it's also a marker of cell death. And we know that up to about 50% of our axons will die in that immediate setting after the nerve injury. Distal to the laceration, there will be Wallerian degeneration. And a couple of days after the in injury, a, a really key thing happens. There's an upregulation of the non-neuronal cells, and most of these are Schwann cells. And they have two very important roles. The first is that they're going to be key in forming the scaffold across which the axons are going to regenerate. And the posh name for the scaffold are the bands of Bungner. And the other thing these uh, cells do is they upregulate neurotrophic substances. And the neurotrophic substances will help to guide the growth cones. So you can see in the diagram that from the parent axon, you get a number of sprouting axons. And at the end of those sprouting axons are the growth cones. The growth cones are surrounded by the phyllopodia, and the phyllopodia will sniff out the fibronectin and the laminin in the basement membrane of the Schwann cells. And that's how they're going to traverse across their zone of injury. And what about what's happening distally? Well, we know that pretty much immediately after denervation, distal to uh, the injury, there will be in the target end organs, i.e. the musculature, muscle fibrosis and atrophy setting in pretty much straight away. And this will continue for about four to six months after the injury, at which point it plateaus once you've lost about 60 to 80% of the muscle volume. Now, we know that once you get much beyond 12 to 18 months after the injury, it's very difficult to functionally re the muscle. And we used to think it was because of this fibrosis and atrophy. But actually now we're getting data from experimental animal models that show that it's more likely to be the progressive failure of the neurons and the Schwann cells um, in sustaining axon regeneration that causes this failure. <clears throat> 
There is a slightly longer time period for sensory receptors, but we don't know exactly how long that that's for. And it's still true that the earlier you do your repairs, the better. I also want to touch on this concept of biotensegrity, which is illustrated beautifully in this video. When you cut a nerve, it retracts. And why is that? Well, it's because the longitudinal fibers in the, ner in the nerve have been pretensioned, and clearly that tension is lost when you cut the nerve. Now, the follow on from this is that when you then repair that nerve, there will be a tension at the suture nerve interface. And that's going to have consequent uh, actions in causing uh, ischemia and scarring. And we'll come back to that later. <clears throat> so let's bring this all together. In essence, what we need to do is get on and do our repairs sooner rather than later, or it might be a reconstruction. So what options have we got available to us? And broadly speaking, these are our options. And the ones that I'm going to be covering today or tonight are going to be these. There is another way that you can think of gap management. The first thing that you can try and do is narrow the gap. And by that, I mean doing some very simple procedures like mobilizing your nerve or transposing it, or even just positioning the joints. And the example I want to use for this is that of a patient we had who had a complete laceration of his sciatic nerve, um, actually secondary to a zombie knife, but that's another story. So having mobilized the nerve, what we did was extended the hip and flex the knee, and just those two very simple procedures brought the nerve ends together sufficiently to allow us to do a tension-free repair. And then after the operation, he was put into a hip spiker uh, to then progressively lengthen him out over time. The next thing you can do is bridge your gap. And by bridging, I mean using either a graft or conduits, or you could bypass it by using tra nerve transfers. The first thing we're going to talk about is going back to the basic principles of how we do nerve repairs. We all know that we have to aim for an anatomic end-to-end -end tension free repair. We'll talk about the magnification that we use, either loops or a microscope, and obviously we need to avoid over tightening. The beauty of the primary repair is that you have just one coaptation site. And one of the things we know, again, from animal studies is that for every coaptation site that axons have to uh, cross over, we're going to lose axons as that happens. And there is a general clinical rule of thumb that you'll probably lose 50% of axons for every repair site. So, so what's this about the, about the tension? We, we talked about having a tension-free repair. Well, this was a study that was published back in 1992. And what the uh, study looked at was what happened to the amplitude of the action potential of a rabbit tibial nerve when it was stretched. And essentially what the authors demonstrated was that with increasing tension, i.e. increasing stretch, the amplitude of the action potential progressively came down until we got to 12% of strain, at which point it stopped completely. So I would urge you to remind yourselves of this the next time you're hoiking the two ends of the digital nerves together in an attempt to get a primary repair, to think about those poor nodes of Rombier that they're just going to stop working when they're put under too much tension. Not only that, but as we've already touched on, if you have strain at the suture nerve interface, that will cause ischemia with consequent scarring, and that's also not great for your nerve repair. What about the magnification? Well, this was an interesting uh, study or 
well, it was, a, it was a mixture of two things. It was a literature review and a study, whereby the authors looked at two things. First of all, all the published evidence on the repair of digital nerves, looking at whether uh, the, there'd been either the use of loops versus microscope. And they also conducted a cadaveric uh, study whereby they compared the repair of nerves using either loops or a microscope and they used a visual grading system to define how well it had been done. So the results from the literature showed that there wasn't a difference in, in the outcomes, whether you used loops or a microscope, but that was, came with the caveat that the loops that had been used were all between four to six times magnification. Meanwhile, the cadaveric study showed that when loops were used, and again using this visual grading system, 29% were done uh, in an excellent manner compared to 60% that were done excellent with, an, with a microscope. So I suppose the take home message is the higher magnification you can use, the better for your nerve repair. I have my 3.5 times mag loops that I'll use as a matter of course, but obviously also we have the microscope, uh, which is 10 times magnification. Obviously you want to avoid over tightening because that's going to encourage either axon or fascicle escape. And what about the, the whole principle of the anatomic repair? Well, this is where neurotrophism is important. Lundborg showed that a motor nerve growing towards the cut end of a motor fascicle will continue to grow and mature, whereas a motor nerve growing towards the cut end of a sensory fascicle will die. And this process is otherwise known as pruning, which then leads us on to talking about epineural versus fascicular repairs. So there's a, an anatomical attractiveness in doing fascicular repairs because theoretically you're getting much better anatomical alignment than with an epineural repair. But actually with the presence of the sutures in the fascicular repairs, and there will obviously be a lot more of them, with the consequent scarring that you get, actually it doesn't make a difference. Um, so we know that there isn't any literature that clearly demonstrates fascicular repairs are any better and they are just as good as epineural ones. So by this point we're thinking, right, we're going to do probably an epineural repair and we want to use minimal sutures, but hang on, I probably want to augment my repair with something else. And this is where fibrin glue becomes important. Now, we've, we've all used fibrin glue. It's a great adjunct. It's very easy to use. And it's actually been in use since the 1940s. The review article actually comes from 2011. And they looked at a series of mainly rat and rabbit models that had been used. And the comparison was done between either purely using sutures or purely using glue. And the outcomes that were looked at were axon regeneration on histology, electrophysiology and behavioral studies. And in all of the studies conducted, there was no difference. Unsurprisingly, most authors also reported that it was considerably easier using fibrin glue and reduced the operating time. It was interesting to know that it was actually yet another of our giants in nerve surgery, Narakas, who reported back in 1984 uh, using fibrin glue. So what he did is he used a mixture of fibrin glue with sutures in the big proximal plexal injuries and then more distally he used just glue in the nerve trunks and the distal branches and he showed that compared with his historical controls, there, there was no difference in the outcomes. And yet again, he also commented about how much easier it was to use the glue. And in particular, because you didn't get the trauma of the needle passing through the epineural layer. 
by the way, if you thought that my uh, French GCSE helped me in translating this paper, it didn't. I was very much reliant on the English translation that came alongside it. So, in summary, what, what I do, and I think this probably speaks for, for a lot of us, is minimal sutures, no more than two or three, and then using um, either eight or nine oh nylon, which I augment with fibrin glue and aiming for a tension free with close apposition but not bunching. What about when the gap is too big? Well, the general principle is that once we get much beyond four mils, there's going to be too much tension. And so we're going to have to look to doing something else. As we've already discussed, there are both, there are physiological reasons for this because of the biotensegrity properties of the nerve. But there are also anatomical reasons. You may have, for example, a big neuroma in continuity to resect, or there is a long zone of injury, secondary to either a crush or a traction injury, or maybe there are oncological causes such as infiltration or a primary tumour. In these cases, primary repair is clearly not indicated, but we need two things. We need a scaffold and we need a source of Schwann cells. I think it's a, a, a pretty much accepted fact that our gold st standard is the, is the autologous nerve graft. And we've got Malasi to thank for this with all of his work that was published from the late 1960s onwards in both the preclinical and the clinical trials that clearly demonstrated their use. It's interesting to note that he makes that key point, which is the reason why we're using a graft is in order to avoid tension at our nerve repair site. And he showed this in both uh, grafting of motor and sensory axons. He, his review article that this came from, which was written in 2007, made the very, the, the key point, which is axons will cross over two good coaptation sites much better than one substandard one. The advantages of the autograft is that you get uh, two for the price of one because you get the immunogenic, immunogenically inert laminin scaffold as well as the Schwann cells to provide the neurotrophic substances. One thing you can't underestimate is donor site morbidity. Obviously, you will get the loss of the donor function, but at the same time, there's also going to be the possibility of neuromas forming at the end of the donor nerves and cold insensitivity. And not only that, but the unsightly scarring that goes with it. And like I said, this isn't to be underestimated. You will need an expendable graft, and we'll come back to this. And if there is a, a big donor recipient mismatch, we're going to need to think about cable grafting, so length will be important. And generally speaking, our indications for autograft are for motor reconstruction, critical sensory reconstruction, and the big proximal plexal injuries. So how are we going to do it? Well, planning is definitely important in these. We need to think about what we're going to use. So for example, if it's a digital nerve that we're reconstructing, then it might be the end of the posterior interosseous nerve after the last motor branch will suffice. If it's something bigger, then we might need to think in the upper limb of using, for example, the medial or the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerves, and in the lower limb, thinking about the serial nerve. We need to think about how we're going to position our patient. Are we going to position them so that we have access for exploring the nerve? Um, but then how does that work with where we're getting our donor from? So or might we need to do it in a staged approach and change the position of our patient throughout the operation. It would be good if we could organize our team so that you have one surgeon doing the exploration whilst uh, and, and preparing the recipient whilst the other is harvesting the nerve. 
And you need to think about the order that you're going to be doing the cabling, for example, where, how you're going to do the back walls um, and things like changing your blades frequently so that you don't tear the tissue. I've included this picture because I think it's, you can't overemphasize enough the importance of preparing your recipient that, so that you've debrided right back to healthy bleeding axons. If, if you compromise this in any way, then all the hard work that we've put in isn't, isn't going to come to anything. So that was just as a reminder. Apart from that, then the principles of repairing uh, the nerve are exactly the same as we've already discussed with the primary repairs. I wanted to just briefly touch on the how we're going to harvest and I've used the example of the sural nerve because that is pretty much our workhorse. You've really got three options. You can have a very long incision, you could have multiple transverse incisions or you could harvest it endoscopically. I'm not a big fan of a long incision. It's quite unsightly and um, particularly for younger patients, they don't like it. So I prefer to do multiple transverse incisions, but this will take a little bit longer, particularly when actually harvesting the nerve to make sure that it doesn't get torn. There is also an endoscopic option, uh, which one of my colleagues at, uh, at Derby does. And, and I think this is actually a very attractive thing to do and something that I want to, to learn to do because I think cosmetically it's much nicer, much reduced donor morbidity. Um, and, and also I just think it looks a lot nicer. So what's about reversing the graft? Well, the, the theory is because, and, and as you can see in this diagram, nerves have got branching points and you don't want regenerating axons to get lost at those branching points. So what we do is we reverse the graft. But actually this is an interesting study that was published in 2016 where admittedly in, a, in an animal model uh, the authors demonstrated that the polarity of the nerve graft actually had no effect on the outcomes and again this being an animal model they looked at the histology with the axon regeneration, electrophysiology and behavioral outcomes. The problem for me is that there isn't yet a clinical study to back this up. And I sort of feel that you're not going to do any harm by reversing your graft. And until there is a clinical trial to, uh, to demonstrate that, that it isn't a problem, I'm going to continue to reverse my grafts. I'm just going to touch on uh, vascularized nerve grafts before we move on. Um, now, I'm very aware that by saying vascularized nerve grafts, I could seriously upset my plastics colleagues and I'll get a good ribbing for this tomorrow because by the very fact that they come with a pedicle, they should surely be uh, called flaps. But it seems that grafts is the word that's used, so we'll stick with that. This is a, a huge topic and one that I'm not going to go into in great detail, but I wanted to mention this review, which was published in 2015, where they looked at pretty much all of the published literature from the clinical trials of the use of vascularized nerve grafts in both upper and lower limbs, as well as uh, plexal injuries. And the first thing that they comment on is that the problem with the evidence is that it's mostly marred by the fact that uh, most studies are either case reports or case series with very few that have a, um, have a direct comparison with standard grafting. But where there is evidence for standard grafting, it is clear that vascularized nerve grafts have got a faster re-innovation time for both sensory and motor functions. So the indications are fairly limited, but they, but they are there for, for example, a non-vascularized bed, for example, if you have an awful lot of scarring. Um, if you're in a wound where there's going to have to be a flap anyway, um, and also if you're needing to take a graft, 
where the donor is not going to be a problem. The problem is with the vascularized nerve grass is the donor it can very much be a problem, say for example, if you're using an ulnar vascularized nerve graft. So that's my brief mention of the vascularized nerve graft. Let's move on now to allografts. Well, allografts like autografts provide this three-dimensional uh, structure for which the axons can regenerate across. If you've got, if, if you're using an acellularized allograft, then you'll be minus the Schwann cells, and you will clearly then have to rely on migration of Schwann cells to provide those neurotrophic substances. The other thing about the, the allograft is that it has to revascularize in situ, and so you can't have a diameter that's much more than five mils. So Remember going back to the cable grafting that we were talking about. Well, the beauty of cable grafting is that it's much easier for the, each of those individual um, grafts to revascularize, unlike a much bigger trunk like you have in the allograft. It goes without saying that their big advantage is that there's no donor site morbidity. And because of that, you're not dictated by the donor as to how much graft you can use. The other relative advantage that comes with this is you, you will only need single limb anesthesia, which means that we can use regional blocks. And that's great if we've got patients who have associated comorbid factors. The big downside with allografts is their expense. Um, they are hugely expensive and we're talking thousands of pounds. Not only that, but uh, if they're not acellularized, then you will need to immunosuppress your patient for up to 12 to 18 months, which can make them vulnerable to opportunistic infections. So if, like me, you work in a trust where you will have to explain the reason to your managers why you desperately need to use this allograft, uh, as opposed to the much more inexpensive option, you have to really think about whether you definitely need this. The thing about all of this is there's always a balance of consideration between patient factors and surgical factors. So this is a, an interesting study. This is um, from Mickey Cho's group and it's about the use of uh, processed nerve allograft um, in a prospectively, uh, in, a, in a registry which is prospectively gathering data on patients who've had the use of the Avance allograft. And this study in particular was looking at the use of the allograft in the upper limb. Altogether, they had 56 patients with 71 nerves and the results come from allograft use in digital nerves, the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. So overall, there were 35 sensory nerves 13 mixed and three purely motor nerves. Now, overall, what they showed was that meaningful recovery, and by meaningful, I mean that they had either S3 or M4 uh, recovery on the MRC grading. So they had meaningful recovery in 89% of the sensory nerves in 75% of the median nerves and in 67% of the ulnar nerves. They also didn't have any implant uh, reactions, which was good, no big complications. So you could look at this two ways. Uh, on the one hand, you could say that in the absence of autograft, these are really very encouraging results. Um, on the other hand, they were clearly bet much better in the smaller diameter sensory nerves than the much bigger, more proximal and mixed nerves. The other curiosity that I found was that it wasn't explicit in the um, paper as to why they used all allograft rather than autograft. So, um, so that was interesting. The other um, 
The other thing that I found was a thesis on the use of allograft in obstetric brachial plexus patients, uh, which was published in Austin a couple of years ago. Um, and the, the thesis actually showed that in lengths of up to 2.5 centimetres, the results from allograft in these patients was as good as the use of autograft, um, but obviously minus the unsightly scarring that you get with harvesting donors. I guess the thing that we need to be aware of is that this was being used in children, and we do know that children have a much better neural regeneration than adults. Um, but again, shows a relative indication for the use of allograft. So I think the important thing from the use of allograft is there are some relative indications for it, certainly in the absence of, of having sufficient autologous nerve um, and where you might be doing things such as um, salvaging failed primary nerve surgery would be a relative indication or thinking about the resection of a large neuroma in non-critical sensory nerves. But overall the indications do seem to be in smaller diameter uh, sensory nerves, particularly in the non-critical regions. And this is actually what's advocated in our NICE guidelines. So as you can see, these were published in 2017 and they're going to be revised again in 2020. But the, they do say that uh, they can be used in smaller diameter, non-critical sensory nerves. And although there aren't any big concerns from either safety uh, or sorry, there are no big concerns from a safety point of view for bigger nerves, um, the efficacy is, is unknown. And they do state that using allographs needs to be done where obviously there's appropriate consent, but also it's being audited. With all the options that we've discussed so far, one of the biggest problems is scarring. And it would be really nice if we could stop this from happening. So how can we do this? Well, the answer could be in the use of conduits. Conduits theoretic, theoretically provide you with a tube that you can put two ends of the nerve in, and it provides a physical barrier to stop any extrinsic scar formation from happening. The next question is, what about the scaffold and the neurotrophic substances? Well, the scaffold, there is a fibrin clot that will form between the two ends of the nerve, which acts as a scaffold. It's not quite as good, but it's okay. As far as the neurotrophic factors are concerned, then we hope that they're going to migrate in. The traditional conduits used were uh, veins, arteries, um, all sorts. It's actually, um, I think it was Gluck and his colleagues back in 1884 who first used um, decalcified bone to approximate the two nerve ends within it. And then following on from this, Stalin and Lundborg did their landmark work using silicon tubes. And they developed this whole idea and, and concept of, of using a tubular system to allow axon regrowth within it. The problem they had is they were using silicon tubes and silicon tubes are non-biodegradable. So generally speaking, if we do use biological cond conduits, they tend to be, like I was saying, things like veins or arteries, which have a tissue structure which is much more like the neural structure, especially with the laminin in the basement membrane. There's an ample supply. It's obviously a, a, not too expensive, um, but like with the nerve graft, there is a donor site morbidity. More recently, there's been an advent of synthetic conduits and uh, the following are just some of the examples that we use. So this is Axagard, which is made out of a porcine intestinal submucosa. Uh, this is Neurogen. It's the uh, conduit that we have in Derby and that's a collagen type one derivative. 
This is Reaxon, which uh, is made of chitosan, and this is Neurolac, which is a PCL derivative. The advantages of conduits is that they can be used both to augment your primary repair, and we can also use them for bridging the gap. The disadvantage is that, uh, like with the allograft, they're expensive, not quite as expensive as the allograft. It's in the hundreds rather than thousands of pounds, but still expensive. And if they're non-biodegradable, you have to be aware that there could be significant foreign body reactions as a result. Like I just said, they can be used to augment your primary repair. And this is the how do you do it? So you can either advance the conduit over the proximal or the distal limb and move it up the limb as far as you can, perform your primary repair, and then advance the conduit back over the repair and put two peripherally placed sutures between the conduit and the epineurium. Alternatively, what you can do is just cut the conduit in half, do your primary repair, and then wrap the conduit around and put a couple of sutures in, and then put your peripherally placed sutures. The other how you do it is in bridging the gap. First of all, measure how big your deficit is. And then what you do is pass your suture from just off center through in an outside in through the conduit, bring your needle out, pass it inside out through the epineurium and back out, then pass your needle back into the conduit and bring it from inside out through the conduit and carefully advance your neural limb into the conduit and knot it down. And then you do exactly the same on the other limb. Sounds easy. I'm sure the vast majority of you will have used conduits and um, I'm certainly the first to put my hand up and say they are really fiddly. You need to practice. It's ideal if you could have a practice on a cadaver, especially using the conduit that you're planning on using, um, because it's definitely not as easy as it looks. And not only that, but each conduit has got its own handling properties. Some of them are translucent, as you've just seen, and some of them need soaking in saline. And all of this you need to be well versed on before you start doing your operation. So what about the why, the why do we do it? So the reason for, um, in the first place, protecting the uh, nerve repair, um, I thought these were two interesting studies. Again, these have both been published relatively recently, and that's coming along with the fact that conduits are, you know, are a much, certainly our synthetic conduits are a more recent development. So, Zoo's paper, which was published in 2017, looked at, limb, uh, at digits which had been replanted and they compared those that had had uh, just a, a standard primary repair compared to those that had a standard primary repair augmented by a tendon derived conduit. And what they found was that there was a reduction in the neuropathic pain in those that had had a conduit uh, augmented repair, but there was no difference between the two groups on the sensory recovery. Meanwhile, Newbrecht's uh, group published the other paper in 2018, which again looks at uh, the comparison between digital nerves that had been repaired with or without a conduit augment, augmenting uh, the repair and they found that there was a improvement in the stereognosis with those that had had a conduit augmented repair and also a reduction in neuroma rates but again no difference in the actual two-point discrimination. I found this an incredibly interesting um, review done by Gregory Bunk and his group, which looked at uh, conduits both as primary repair and bridging the gap adjuncts. 
over, and, and they looked at all of the published clinical trials so far that have looked at the use of conduits. And, and overall, their recommendations were that it is good at augmenting a primary repair. And if the gap is no bigger than 10 mils and it's in a small diameter uh, sensory nerve, then in bridging the gap, it, it is also satisfactory. But the results are much less impressive when the gaps are any longer than 10 mils or are in motor nerves. But what really caught my eye in this review was the complication rates, which in some studies was up to 100%. Now, I appreciate that those studies had small numbers in them, um, but even in the studies with bigger numbers, so the one that had 86, there was still a 13% complication rate. And this included patients needing revision surgery, as well as, um, uh, as, well as the fact that they were foreign body reactions and extrusions. Now, I don't personally have any, uh, or I've not had any complications with the use of Neurogen, but I think as clinicians, there is, we, you know, our mantra is to do no harm. And I think we have to consider very carefully um, when we're using conduits, what we're using and why we're using them for, oh, and why we're using them. So, which brings us now on to nerve transfers. I couldn't really do this talk without at least mentioning them, but they are a huge topic. And I know one that was already touched on by Don Power in his talk on brachial plexus injuries a couple of weeks ago. So I'm not about to go into great detail. I just really wanted to reiterate the principle of why we do nerve transfers. We do them because we're changing essentially a proximal lesion into a distal lesion. And where this is really important is, for example, in the uh, big brachial plexus injuries, where there are long zones of injuries, and even following reconstructive procedures, the nerve has got a long way to, to traverse before it can get to its target and organ. The example I've used here is that of the uh, spinal accessory nerve transfer to the suprascapular nerve. So we know that the suprascapular nerve is a confluence of the C5-6 and it winds its way posteriorly, goes under the transcapular ligament, gives off the branch to the supraspinatus and then dives down, goes around the spinal glenoid notch and innervates the infraspinatus. So the nerve transfer is using one of the branches to trapezius. Uh, the trapezius has got both medial and lateral branches, which means that you have an expendable donor because you will still have something left to sufficiently innovate the trapezius. And you swing the branch round and you transfer it onto the suprascapular nerve just prior to that first branch to supraspinatus. There are several advantages of nerve transfers. Like we said, they change a proximal to a distal lesion, uh, which means that um, the axons are close to the target end organ, which will minimize your time for re -innovation. And there is the capability of restoring both sensory and motor functions. But there is still a donor morbidity to consider, and you have to carefully consider this prior to your undertaking it. So it kind of makes sense that what their indications are um, as illustrated here. And these are examples of the nerve transfers that we can use for specific motor functions. What's the evidence to back them up? Well, this paper was actually published by Susan McKinnon's group last year. There has been again, an advent of using nerve transfers, they are becoming increasingly more and more popular. Um, but as is problematic whenever you're looking at the use of nerve transfers, most of the time the published literature uh, gives you the results from the nerve transfers, but there's very little to give us comparisons back to standard grafting. But this paper 
uh, looked at which the trials that, that were published that had got comparisons. And it was interesting to note that um, certainly in the case of an isolated nerve injury that had, where, the prox where the musculature was in the proximal upper limb, that actually the results compared to nerve transfers were no better than standard grafting. Where nerve transfers do much better are where there's multiple injuries in the polytrauma um, and also where, unsurprisingly, the nerve has got a long way to go to get to its end organ, an example being the ulnar nerve. So, as I was saying, it's a big topic. That's about as much as we're going to cover this evening. Um, I think they are an exciting part of our management of peripheral nerve injuries, particularly in those big brachial plexus lesions with multiple injuries, segmental injuries, long zones of injury. There is more. Uh, we haven't talked about the different types of nerve transfers, such as reverse enterside or enterside. There is translational work uh, using la laser thermal spot welding. Uh, we could try and reduce our innovation times using uh, factors such as tacrolimus. And there are also the salvage procedures, such as free muscle transfers and tendon transfers. I know uh, Mr. Samets has already given you an excellent talk on tendon transfers. But I think it's time that we start to draw some conclusions. Um, and when making a decision on the appropriate treatment, it is a balance of patient factors and surgical factors and surgeon experience. We have a toolkit that's available to us and it's about making a decision based on all of those things put together. Looking to the future, uh, so the first thing is going to be the sutureless repair. And I know that there is an ongoing study in Birmingham at the moment where they're looking at the sutureless repair using a connector of digital nerves. And uh, we're really excited about hearing what the results from that show us. Other things that I think are going to be important, it would be great if we could have a tissue engineered conduit that matches or exceeds that of grafting. And we also need some clinical methods of target innovation um, or sorry, of target maintenance until we can re-innovate the, the muscle. I think if you're just going to read one paper, it's definitely worth reading this one uh, by Lundborg, which he published in the Journal of Hand Surgery in 1999. There are some beautiful descriptions of the physiology following on from nerve injury and also the concepts that we have to address if we're going to optimise our nerve repair and regeneration. I'm aware I've talked about lots of giants in nerve surgery through this talk. And I know this because I did a practice run through of this talk with my daughter and I then found her a bit later on, I'd like to add she is four years old. I found her later on searching for uh, all these giants that mummy kept on talking about in her talk. The problem is there is somebody else I want to mention before we wrap this up and that's Sunderland. And the reason why is because Sunderland said in 1990, when he summarized 40 years of experience in nerve surgery, that in essence, early repair does better than late. One nerve coaptation site is better than several. Short grass do better than uh, long grass. Young do better than old. And a distal repair is much better than a proximal repair. And I think this is just as true today as it was then. Thank you very much. <laughs>